There have been a couple of things recently that have taken place in my life that have left me in what I would call a state of introspection. And have you ever got to those moments on, in life where you just sort of take a pause, maybe something happens that causes this pause to happen, or for whatever reason, you just are in this place where you begin to stop and think a little bit deeper about what life really is and what's really important in life. Um, the first thing that happened was the death of a friend of mine named Leo, who died of a brain tumor just a few weeks after his 60th birthday. And Leo was the kind of friend that, that when I think of him, even though I hadn't seen him for a couple of decades, he was the kind of friend that if I were to see him, it would be like we would just pick up where we left off. He had that, he was just that kind of person. And it was a couple of months ago that he was diagnosed with a brain tumor and then celebrated his 60th birthday at the end of January and passed away mid-February. And I would describe him as a one-of-a-kind guy. And, and I knew him from elementary school. In fact, his younger brother was in my grade. And then we sort of re got reconnected as adults. And this man named Leo was one of the most evangelistic people I've ever met. I mean, talk about someone who could naturally, in conversation, talk about Jesus, no matter where that person was spiritually, he was the most evangelistic person I had ever met. And I remember he was actually one of my youth leaders. He played guitar and led our youth in worship. And there was this time where we went horseback riding as a youth group. And Leo came along on the horseback ride. So it was Beth and I and some other youth leaders and a bunch of, of teenagers. And as we were riding these large mammals, um, Leo began to strike up a conversation with our guide. And just in the most natural way, he said to her, do you know Jesus? And, and it wasn't awkward. You know, that question could be really awkward. You, you can ask it in a way that's pushy. You can ask it in a way that's awkward. You can ask it in a way uh, that is just not right. But the way he did it was so smooth. And so he was, he was just that kind of person. And then last Sunday was the 15th anniversary of my own mother's death. And I was, I was amazed because I thought, how fast life can pass us by. I think of those of you that have little ones or you have children in the home that are, that are in school and you know this to be true. My, my oldest daughter said this phrase that has stuck out to me. She said it a couple months ago, something, something about the days are long but the years are short. And as I stood at my mom's grave, I was reminded 15 years just went by like that. I had an uncle that, my uncle Charles, and my uncle called me Timmy from the time I was a little boy till the time that he would pass away. And my uncle would say to me, Timmy, life is a blink of the eye, a blink of the eye, Timmy. And the older I get, the more I see that that's true. So last week, I did something I hadn't done in a while, and I visited my mother's grave. And with us were uh, some other family, my brother and his family, and uh, along with us was my five-year-old grandson. And if you've never been to a cemetery with a five-year-old, you may want to put that on your bucket list. It's just a different kind of experience. And he actually rode to the cemetery with us. And as we were riding, I was thinking, he's five years old. Do five-year-olds know what a cemetery is? Do they know what a graveside is? I mean, it's not like in preschool, they say, oh, get on the bus, kids. We're going to go run around the cemetery. 
And so I started talking to him as, as we were going there, and I found out, yes, he knew what a cemetery was. Yes, he knew what a grave site was, and, but that he had never been to inside a cemetery, but he knows what they are when he sees them. So we were, we were good to go there. And we got to the, the graveyard, and uh, the first thing that we had to explain to him is that we are not here to see every single one of these graves. He just wanted to kind of, he thought we were, you know, like an exhibit or something, like we just need to see, see every one of them. And, and we were standing by my, uh, standing at my mother's grave. And all of a sudden it hit me that, that here, standing before me, my five-year-old grandson is my mother's great-grandson. And my mother never had the opportunity to meet her grandson and granddaughter. And, and Beth and I have said over the years so many times how much my mom would have loved those great grandchildren. And we were standing at the grave and all of a sudden I, I, I tried to put this into perspective for, for my grandson and, and I said, um, this is your daddy's daddy's mommy. This is your great grandmother, and you never got to meet her. But if you were to get, to, if, if you would have had the opportunity to meet you, meet her, she would have loved you. She would have prayed for you. She would have showered love, love upon you. This is your great, great grandmother. And I said to him, if you could say anything to your great grandmother today, what would you say? And you know how kids can sometimes say things that are so profound? I thought, what if this is one of those moments? And he looked up at me and he said, I would say, nice to meet you. <laughs> and I said, okay, that'll work. That'll work. It's a start. But this morning, I want to look at what I believe is one of the most important questions Jesus ever asked. In fact, it is the very first question Jesus asks in the Gospel of John. And it's one of those questions where if we look at it at a surface level, it doesn't seem to be all that important. But I think that when we look at it at the depth of what Jesus meant it to be, then it has a lot to say to us and it may be one of the most important questions that Jesus ever asked. In fact, I would go so far as to say it is a question that Jesus, through his word, is still asking today. And we're going to get into the story, but I want to just give you the question now. Jesus is, is kind of standing there and walking by, and two of the disciples of John See Jesus going by, and we'll look at the text, but he says, behold the Lamb of God, and the Bible tells us that they left John, and they begin to follow Jesus. And then Jesus turns around to them and says this most profound question that could be one of the most important questions he ever asked and still asks today. He looked at those disciples and he said this, what are you seeking? What do you want? I like the way the NIV and other translations translate this as imagine Jesus turning around and the first time the Lamb of God speaks, he turns and says to these men, and really men, they were more like teenage boys. And he said, what do you want? What do you want? And I think it's one of the most important questions that Jesus ever asked because every one of us is wanting something. We're all seeking something in life and wanting something out of life. And I think that how we answer Jesus' question can lead us on the path, uh, this glorious quest to know Jesus more, to hunger for Jesus more, to pan after Jesus, to follow after Jesus, to fall in love with Jesus, or it can lead to what I would call the everlasting frustration of trying to fill our lives with lesser things. 
And I don't know about you, but even as a follower of Jesus, as as I've followed the Lord now for four decades, there's time even as a follower of Jesus that I can kind of get off track. There's times where the stuff of earth sort of clouds and eclipses the things that are eternal. And, and it's, it's these experiences that I've had of my friend's death and then my, my, the anniversary of my mother's death that have shaped this message to look at the question and the quest for more of Jesus. Boil down life to this and you live for this, your life will be fulfilled. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Our aim, our quest is to encounter Jesus' best in life for the rest of your life. Jesus' best in life for the rest of your life. So I'd like you to turn to John chapter 1, verses 35 to 39, as we look at this important question that Jesus asked, looking at the question and the quest for more of Jesus. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35 in the Bible that I'm using, the ESV, has a title above it that says, Jesus calls his first disciples. So that is what is happening here, although that is not in the original text. That is what is happening here. And it says that the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked as Jesus walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? What do you want? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. I want to put this uh, encounter into uh, a perspective that this, as the title says, that Jesus is calling his very first disciples and this takes place on the third day of Jesus's ministry, that after, after he sort of came out as Israel's Messiah in John chapter 1, John chronicles these days of Jesus, and it says that the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. So that means if John is again standing with his disciples, the next day, that means what was John doing yesterday? He was standing and seeing Jesus walk by. And John says something very profound. He says, behold the Lamb of God. And notice what John did not say. John did not say, behold the Lamb of God. Stop following me. Start following him. Behold the Lamb of God. Go after him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. John was these disciples' rabbi. John was their teacher. John was the one that they wanted their life to emulate. And yet when, when, Jesus, when John saw Jesus passing by, it seems like there was enough revelation for them to, to leave one teacher, one rabbi, and follow Jesus. And that just, uh, that didn't happen in the first century. And then we get this picture that these two disciples are following him, but, but I get the picture that they followed him, uh, maybe some distance, maybe some, you know, 12 feet or, or, you know, it wasn't like they just immediately followed Jesus, walked up, put their arms around him and said, hey, Jesus, I think we'd like to be your two first d- disciples. We get this picture that they're walking, they're following Jesus, but they're following Jesus and there's some distance between them because then Jesus turns around and ask them, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? Or 
as the NIV and other modern translations say, what do you want? And notice that Jesus' question here is not a who. Jesus didn't say, who do you want? I think you want me, but let me just make sure. Who is it that you want? But Jesus asked him what I would call this existential question of, of what is it that you want? And I think that this is, this is a question that on, on one surface level, we can have an answer, but on, on another level, there's something much deeper going on. Because in Jesus' day, this was true. This statement that I'm going to make it was true in the first century Israel. And this true, this statement of first century Israel is true today that everybody is seeking something. So Jesus asks, what are you seeking? What do you want? And I believe that it's a question that is that that like all of these questions that, that Jesus, we've been looking at the questions of Jesus that that on one level they seem so simple, and yet there's a depth here that the question or the question grabs us. The question requires some thinking about. So Jesus asked, What are you seeking? He asked you today, he asked me today, what are you seeking? What is it that you want. And I find this question absolutely profound because John's gospel is, I'm going to give you a theologian's term and then I'll explain it. Some of you will know what it means. But John's gospel has what is called the highest Christology. Christology simply means the study of Christ. And John's gospel sort of rises to the top because the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic gospels, and they're looking at Jesus and shaping Jesus' stories about Jesus in a certain way, but John has the highest Christology. In fact, from the very first verse, some of you know this verse, right? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the... Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John begins his gospel, not like some of the other gospels where we get a little bit of his prenatal uh, things going on or his birth. John skips all of that, takes us all the way back to the absolute beginning and says that in the absolute beginning, in the furthest beginning that you can begin to imagine, he already was this, this Word. And then it says that the word, the word was God. And then as we read on and he's talking about Jesus, he says the word became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And yet you would think at, with this high Christology of exalting Jesus to, to the place that he truly deserves and, and telling us the, the, how high Jesus was, so to speak, before becoming man and becoming a servant, the very first words of Jesus' mouth here. I mean, they, you could not get a much more earthly question as this word of God becomes flesh and says to these disciples and says to us, what are you seeking? Do you ever ask yourself that question? What is it, what is it that, that, that I really want? in life. And I think that there's a couple ways that we could answer this. And one is one is what like how we think we should answer it. Have you have you ever been asked a question and the way you answered that question was not probably the truest heart inside but but you you knew that this was the answer that this person wanted to hear. It's, it's kind of like, I love, I love working with Good News Club. These kids are absolutely amazing. And, and here's, here's what happens in Good News Club sometimes. Um, if a child does not know the answer, they will raise their hand anyway. <laughs> and when we call on them, the answer will be God, God. <laughs> and sometimes we answer because we think that's the answer that, this is how we should answer it, right? 
There's, it says we should answer that Jesus is my bottom line. Jesus is what I'm living for. Jesus is what all my, my life is really all about. But then there's that way of answering it perhaps after some reflection of how we would honestly answer it. And I believe that when we get to that place and we say, Jesus, this is where I want to be. This is my heart. Maybe you're here and you've just got wrapped up in some things of earth. And Jesus hasn't had first place in your life. I think for those of us that that would say, Jesus, this is where I want to be. Jesus' invitation to us is the same as his disciples. And his invitation is always, come and see. I don't feel worthy, Lord. Jesus says, come and see. Lord, I've fallen away. Jesus says, come and see. Lord, my ra- mind's been wrapped up in things that shouldn't be wrapped up in. I've been doing things that, it, that I, maybe I shouldn't have been doing. Jesus says, will you just come and see? And, and then there, we have this question to the question that these disciples gave. Jesus asked them a question. What do you want? They answered Jesus' question with a question. When Jesus says, what do you want? They don't say, well, I am so glad you asked that, Lord, because there's some things I want in life. And since you open the door and you want to have this conversation, I'll tell you what I want. And maybe, you know, if you're the Lamb of God, maybe, you know, you can work some things out and make sure that I get some of these things that I want. But they don't do that. They asked a question with a question. And they wanted to know, where are you staying? Where are you staying? In other words, think about this question. Where can we find you? Where can we be with you? They weren't interested in an address. They were interested in an encounter with Jesus. And here again, Jesus' answer to every one of us, come and you will see or simply come and see. And with those words, I think Jesus was saying a whole lot more than come and you're going to see a physical building where I'm staying. I think Jesus' invitation to come and see was an invitation to come and have their eyes opened to the more that only he could give. John's gospel is a gospel that is filled with what is called dualism. That means John takes two opposites and he puts them together. John John and John chapter one talks about darkness and light. Two things opposite put together, darkness and light. In John chapter three, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he takes two opposite things, flesh and spirit, and puts them together, two opposite things put together, so when, when, G, when John uses the word see, there's something more going on here than physical sight. In John chapter 9, we see this come to kind of like a head where there is a man. Remember this story? Like the man is not only blind, but he was born blind. So this is like the miracle of miracles to the ancient world. Blind people had been healed. There had been blind people healed probably before Jesus' time, but no one had ever been healed of blindness, a blindness since birth. And then Jesus heals the man, and immediately there's like no, there's no like great celebration party from the religious leaders. What do they begin to do? They begin to attack G- Jesus. They even call Jesus in that text, if I remember correctly, he, that he was a sinner. They implied he was a sinner, that God doesn't listen to sinners. And what John wants us to see in John chapter 9, that there's some, something more going on than just simply physical sight and physical blindness. That this man who was physically blind has now been opened his eyes physically and also spiritually, while those that should have had their eyes open to Israel's Messiah were blind to it. So when Jesus says, come and see, I think it's a loaded invitation to so much more than we can probably imagine. 
We, we began this year with wanting more in 2024. And I believe that this is God's heart for us. This is God's invitation to us through these simple words of come and see. And from where I stand, I see this being lived out every single week of this year. There are conversations going on that are saying stuff like this. There is something different going on here. And I think it's that, that hunger for more of Jesus. We had someone share with us just this past week. And she said to Beth that, that she was up in the middle of the night praying for Beth and I. And when I heard those words, what came to my mind was, that doesn't happen unless God is getting ready to do something. Wake up in the middle of the night to pray for your pastor, to pray for your church. Jesus says, come and see to encounter Jesus' best in life for the rest of your life. And I want to give a picture of what that looks like. Because when Jesus says, come and follow me, come and see, it's not as though life stops. But it means that life is now focused. I remember when I was 19 years old and I surrendered my life to Jesus. I had come to Christ at the age of 13 but at the age of 17 and 18, uh, I know this has never happened to your children, but I kind of thought I knew it all. And I went off the path. And when I came back to Jesus at the age of 19 and surrendered, life didn't stop for me. When I surrendered my life to Jesus, I still had the same job, still had the same friends, still had the same family members, there was a lot in my life that just kind of looked the same. What, what looked different was not that life stopped, but life now had focus. And Jesus' purpose for your life, I'm going to give you four of them, and these are what I would call the four purposes of Jesus and it's the four purposes that when Jesus ascended on high, poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, this is the calling, this is the purpose, this is the focus for every follower of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you, you stop life. You still take care of the kids. You still uh, change diapers. You still do what you do. But you do it with focus and experience the more Jesus has. First thing that Jesus did, I think they're on your outline sheet, is, is explain God. Explain God. Did you know if you claim to be a follower, if you say, Jesus, you, I am a follower of yours, then your life, Jesus wants to fill your life in such a way that your life explains God to the rest of of the world. First thing we find out in John's gospel, that Jesus, who was God, Jesus, who was the word with God, or the Greek literally means the word face to face with God, became flesh. In other words, he explained what God was like by becoming human. And his desire is to fill every one of us with his spirit, that our lives explain what God is like. And when we claim his name, when we put our name and attach his name to us, you know, there will be people that will never pick up this word to read until they see Jesus, the word living inside of you, living inside of me. And all of the things that we have in the New Testament, the way that the, way that, that the Bible says all of the epistles are filled with, this is how you should live as a follower of Jesus. And Jesus says some pretty profound things. All of this is to explain God to a world that is confused and has no idea what, the, what God is really like. 
Jesus would say to his followers some, uh, to his followers, some pretty uh, radical things. Jesus would say, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus would say, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to pray for your enemies. I want you to do good to those that are the worst person in your life. Why? Because Jesus wants his followers to get walked on and be doormats? No, because his greatest call is that we might explain what God is like. And when the church, when people of God turn the other cheek and love their enemies, what we say to the world is this is the kind of God we serve. This is what God is like. Not a God that got vengeance on his enemies, but a God who loved his enemies and allowed himself to, to be slapped and beaten and crucified for them. Our lives explain God. Wake up tomorrow. Wake up right now and say, my life is to explain God. This is something, this, and by the way, you don't get a certain age. And then when you get this age, you qualify. Middle schoolers, high schoolers, children, explain God. The second thing is Jesus not only explained God, but Jesus extended God's kingdom. He extended God's kingdom. And there's an, uh, uh, just an awesome verse in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that, that what the author is doing in this speech is he is taking everything that Jesus of Nazareth was about and he boils it down to, to essentially two words. When he says that Jesus of Nazareth went about the countryside, here are the two words, doing good. Doing good. When we do good in his name, we extend the kingdom. The third thing that, that Jesus' life was about and what our lives are about is equip others, to equip others. In the beginning was the word and the, and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and walked like the Lone Ranger. No, no. If there was ever a human being that you would think, this man needs no other human beings, it would be Jesus. And yet, the first thing Jesus did was community, it equipped others. In other words, I want you to follow me. I want you to come and see so that you are like me and others see me in you and become disciples of mine apprentices of mine. You know, we have that even in today's language, don't we? Like, like if somebody's a, a, a plumber and this person says, well, I am an apprentice to this master plumber. Hard question here this morning, but what do you think that they're going to do with their life? They're not going, I, I am a, I'm an apprentice under this master plumber so that I can learn and go out and operate on someone. You're an apprentice to do what the master does. And that's what equipping others is about. And then, and then the final one is one that we don't hear a lot about in our world today, but to exchange your life for his. To exchange your life for his. This is where Paul would say things like, not I, but Christ. Not I but Christ. And again, it doesn't mean that your life stops. It doesn't mean the things that, that, that you've done for the last however long just cease to exist. But it means that we live with this focus of coming and seeing and adopting and holding on to the four purposes that Jesus had for his life. So I want to just simply ask you this question. How is Jesus' question hitting you today? How is Jesus' question hitting you today when he, when he says, what do you want? What do you want? How is Jesus intersecting right now with your life as it is today? 
in all of its imperfections. And Jesus is saying to you, come and see. Will you believe that there is more, more of him to be experienced? And I said it earlier, I see a church that is beginning to be filled (laughs) with people who want more. I see people responding to Jesus' invitation to be disciples. I see people that are living out their lives to explain what God is like in various ways and exchanging their life for his and extending his kingdom and equipping others. So I'm going to ask that you would just bow your head this morning. And the only thing I want right now for you is what the Holy Spirit would say to you. I pray that every other voice would be blocked out, God, so that only your voice remains. Jesus says, come and see. How does that invitation hit you where you live today? Because wherever we are on our journey, there's something to say in that. There's something he's saying to us. We're just going to have a moment of silence and then I just want you to respond in whatever way. Maybe it's a quiet whisper of yes. Maybe it's coming up to pray at the prayer benches like we've already had people come today. This is just you and Jesus. It's us and Jesus.